Today on America's Test Kitchen, Bridget and Julia make pan-seared flank steak with mustard chive butter. Adam reveals his favorite carbon steel skillets to Julia. And Becky shows Bridget an easy recipe for walk-away ratatouille. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. Flank steak is the boneless, skinless chicken breast of the beef world. It cooks quickly, there are no bones to fuss with, and you can use it to make everything from fajitas to stir fries. But cooked as just a steak, well, it's got some real problems to deal with. Flank steak has a very distinctive grain running right through that muscle, and when cooked, it buckles. That creates a thick end and a thin end, and those cook unevenly. Mm -hmm. And it tastes like an old rubber tire. <laughs> <laughs> which is not good. But today we're gonna get flank steak its due and I've got a few tricks up my sleeve. Moving on to our patient here. It weighs between one and a half to one and three quarter pounds. And one of the problems that we have with flank steak is fitting it into the pan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even a 12 inch skillet, it's going to be kind of a problem fitting that into the pan. It'll start creeping up the sides. Eventually it shrinks, but we wanna get it all into the pan at the same time. So this is one of the most genius things I've ever heard of. We're going to cut it so that it fits. <laughs> cut it out. <laughs> so I'll take a sharp chef's knife. I'll go right across the grain and then lengthwise. There we go. So we do want to add some seasonings to this. We want seasonings to penetrate the meat, but we also want to help out with browning on the exterior because it is a relatively thin piece of meat. So we want to brown quickly before it cooks all the way through. So I'm going to take some paper towels and just pat it dry. You can also do this while the steak is in one piece. And now I'm going to make a little bit of a seasoning mix. All right, I have two teaspoons of kosher salt and they've got nice large grains. It's gonna be easy to rub this onto the meat. I'm going to mix a teaspoon of sugar. That's really going to help with browning. And a half a teaspoon of black pepper. Easy to mix together and then I'll rub it on all sides of the steak. All right, and I'll just press this on so it adheres to the meat. Flip it over. All right, once again, press it all in. Now I'm going to transfer this to a rimmed baking sheet. I put a wire rack right on there. It's going to elevate the steaks so that some heat can get underneath them and also help them cook. Now we're not gonna sear these right on the stove top. I was top. just gonna say, <laughs> what's your game plan here? <laughs> yes, it's a very large skillet. <laughs> Now we're gonna bake these in the oven, and I say bake because we're not roasting them. It's a really, really low oven, 225. And the reason is, is we don't want a super blast of heat to start and shrink these flank steaks up because they will buckle. And also it'll squeeze out all that moisture from the inside of the steaks. Now the oven is also going to help us later on with browning. It's going to dry out the exterior of the steaks. Later on, there won't be any moisture on there that we have to get rid of before we sear. Now, since these are going into such a low oven and there are four steaks and we want to make sure that they all cook pretty evenly, well, instead of going in there every few minutes with an instant read thermometer, mm -hmm. I'm going to use, love these, a yes. probe thermometer. Ah. And I'll go ahead and just place this right in the center of one of these steaks. Because if you're opening the oven door all the time, that oven's already pretty low. If you lose all that heat, you could extend the cooking time of the steak by a long time. A lot long, that's right. And you'd end up with pretty much dried steaks instead mm -hmm. of cooked steaks. I'm gonna put these in the oven. I'll keep this right on the side and we'll know exactly when these reach 120 degrees. All right, the alarm says it's 120. They and still look raw on the outside. They do. They're not too pretty at this point. It's like very thick beef jerky right now. It is. Now we are going to sear. So I've been heating up two tablespoons of vegetable oil over medium high heat. I'm gonna wait for that to come up to the point where it just starts to smoke. In the meantime, we're going to make a compound butter. Mm. So I've got three tablespoons of unsalted butter, softened. Now I just like to mash it up a little bit before I add all my ingredients. A tablespoon of minced chives, a little bit of Dijon mustard, that's two teaspoons, a half a teaspoon of grated lemon zest, and a teaspoon of lemon juice. Ooh, that's going to taste good. Mm -hmm, nice and light. Mustard, lemon, and chives. And butter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there we go. Set that aside. Let's get back to the skillet. And we can see that the oil, She's at a shimmer. So now we can go ahead and place these steaks in, and then I'm gonna flip them every minute. And that's to ensure that they don't overcook and to develop a really nice brown crust. 
All right, we've passed the first minute. I'm gonna go ahead and flip these over. Oh, those steaks are starting to look a whole lot better. And as you mentioned, they are curling on that one side. Mm -hmm. And by flipping them every minute, that's gonna fix the curl. Another minute, another flipping time. Mm -hmm. So the flank steak has long muscle fibers that shrink up when they come in contact with a hot pan, which causes the steak to buckle. Once the steak is buckled, it's no longer flat, and that means you won't get even browning. By flipping the meat every minute, the muscle fibers on both sides of the steak shrink at the same rate, thereby reducing the buckling effect. Mmm, this should be our last flip over. These steaks look amazing. <laughs> All right, let's turn the heat off. These are coming out of the skillet. <laughs> oh, yes. Boy, those are really gorgeous. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. I mean, we eat flank steak all the time at our house. I don't think I've ever made them look that beautiful before. So we're going to leave these for about 10 minutes so that they can cool down so we can eat them. And also, it's just going to allow any juices in the meat to redistribute. They are still there. I counted them before <laughs> we waited 10 minutes. And I'm proud of you because there's still four mm -hmm. on that sheet pan. Yeah, you're lucky. <laughs> I came close to taking a little nibble. I bet you did. Well, we are going to go ahead and slice into these. Just gonna slice open two. One for you, one for me. And we'll come back and eat the other two. <laughs> so now I'm gonna add a little bit of butter, about one and a half teaspoons. I'll spread it out a little oh, bit. Oh, oh yes. Now you're talking. Oh, butter on steak is just the best idea. So I'm going to slice these against the grain. Very, very thinly, as thinly as I can. That is perfectly cooked steak. Come to mama. Oh, no gray band. No. All pink in the middle drenched with butter. Hello. <laughs> How's that? Gorgeous. Feel free to dollop some more butter on yours. We Will have some do. extra chives here. Mm. All right. Let's see how this tastes. That is a thing of beauty. Mm. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. It tastes like a really expensive steak. It's super tender, perfectly cooked in that butter. I have to say with that little bit of Dijon, that's where it's at. Ordinary flank steak can be transformed into an extraordinary dinner. Start by cutting the steak into pieces fit for a skillet and add salt and sugar to season and help brown. Then bake the steaks in a low oven before searing them in a hot skillet to develop a delicious crust. Beat that buckle by flipping them every 60 seconds. And finally, slice thinly against the grain for maximum tenderness and serve with a flavorful compound butter. And there you have it. From our test kitchen to your home kitchen, an out-of-this-world pan-seared flank steak with mustard chai butter. I'm a minimalist when it comes to kitchen equipment, especially if it's expensive. But these gorgeous carbon steel skillets have caught my eye, and Adam's going to tell me if it's worth finding room for them in my cupboard. Well, you know, Julia, these actually might really appeal to the minimalist in you because carbon steel, which used to be a very popular material for cookware, has sort of fallen by the wayside because it requires some maintenance. It will rust if it's not seasoned like cast iron and maintained carefully. It's not that popular anymore, although restaurant kitchens use it mm -hmm. because it's supposed to sear just like a cast iron pan will. It's supposed to develop stick resistance like a good non-stick pan will. Huh. And because it sears well and it's stick resistant, it's pretty versatile. So you can use it like a tri-ply, you know, traditional skillet. So I gathered this lineup of eight pans that you have before you now. Mm -hmm. They all measure about 12 inches in diameter, as close as we could get. Most of them cost between $40 and $80 except I'm guessing not this guy <laughs> you guessed He's right gorgeous this one is beautiful it's handmade in Washington State and the price reflects that this was $230 oh hello now we had to do some seasoning before we got going on the test and you can go to the website to see the whole seasoning procedure that we go through they also had to be maintained carefully dried and then wiped with a little bit of oil while they were warm between cleanings and definitely keep the detergent away from them just like cast iron the tests included frying eggs and just a teaspoon of butter we made cheese omelets we made tart to tans, those beautiful French Ooh. desserts that has to be turned out of the pan, so sticking is a big problem there. And we also seared steaks. Wow. After that initial seasoning, before we started the testing, 
All of these performed really well with fried eggs, with omelets, and even with the tarte de tans, which can get awfully sticky, as you know. Yeah. And in fact, as we dried them, maintained them carefully, and rubbed them with oil while they were hot, that stick resistance even improved throughout the testing. Huh. The seared steaks were beautiful. Really? You can see they had a very, very deep brown crust, just like a cast iron pan would. We seared burgers, we made Szechuan green beans, and we fried potatoes. And you know what? It performed really? beautifully in all of those tests as well. Now, it was weight that began to separate some of the best from the rest. The weight range was a low of about 3.3 pounds, and that was this guy right here. The heaviest one was 6.2, which is right in front of you. Pick oh, that's that a two-hander. That's a two-hander, mm -hmm. exactly. Our testers actually preferred something right in the middle of those. This guy here was 4.7 pounds, a nice mid-weight pan. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that is good. It feels nice. It seared just as well cast iron but you know our favorite traditional cast iron skillet is seven pounds ten ounces so yes, you have I a know. big weight savings there <laughs> the cooking area ranged from a low of about eight inches in this pan to a high of about ten inches in that pan and we prefer the slightly more generous ten inches just because food doesn't bunch up and steam it has enough room to really sear another issue was the handle some of the testers some of the ones who are even a little bit shorter found that these <laughs> tall handles, the ones that were set at a steep angle or that were too long, felt more awkward to them than a shorter handle at a lower angle. They felt the same way about sides of the pan. If the sides were too steep, it was hard to work a utensil underneath there and work with the food. In the end, this was a really impressive group of pans. The tester's favorite was this one. This is the Matfer Bourja black steel round fry pan, 11 and 7 eighths inches, $44.38. It did everything well in our tests. Of course, testers also love this beauty here. This is uh, the Blue Skillet Ironware 13-inch fry pan. It didn't win first place because of the cost. It's $230, but it is gorgeous. Yeah, I wouldn't even put this in the cupboard. This would be on the showpiece center of my stove. <laughs> Definitely. So there you have it. When buying a new carbon steel pan, look for the Matfer Bourgeois Black Steel Round Frying Pan. Ratatouille is one of those dishes that sounds like a great idea, especially for homegrown vegetables. You take zucchini, some eggplant, peppers, of course tomatoes, and stew them together. But believe it or not, if we were to take all these vegetables and squeeze them, we'd end up with this, a huge container of water. And that, when it's all cooked together, translates into this. This is a watery, soggy mess. Very soupy, more like ratatouille soup than anything else. All pulpy. And even worse, the ingredients are indistinguishable in taste, color, and texture. So I'm here with the expert on ratatouille, Becky, who's going to show us how to make a much better version. That's right. I think I can do a much better job. <laughs> I know you can. <laughs> As you said, a lot of these ratatouille recipes are just full of water, even though they call for pretreatment steps like salting, microwaving, or pressing the vegetables to try and get rid of some of that water. We're not going to do any of those pretreatment steps, but we're going to still end up with something that's much better. That's hard for me to believe because we've always gone to salting or pressing vegetables to extract all that moisture before, so I can't wait to see what you have in store. Yeah, I have a trick up my sleeve. <laughs> We have a third of a cup of extra virgin olive oil in the Dutch oven. I am adding two onions, and they're chopped pretty large. You can see they're in one inch pieces. We're trying to streamline this recipe and not do lots of fussy prep. We're not gonna cut everything into really tiny dice. Great. So, two onions going in the pot. Your ratatouille started off as almost a peasant dish, a very rustic dish, and it's turned into kind of this fancy restaurant food. So I'm right. so glad to see you taking it back to simple. Simple and amazingly delicious. <laughs> I'm also adding eight whole cloves of garlic. Again, we're not mincing them. Teaspoon of salt and a quarter teaspoon of pepper. Just give that a stir. So we just want the onions to start to break down and soften a little bit. That's gonna take seven to 10 minutes. And while those work, we'll go over to the eggplant. So I have a one and a half pound globe eggplant here. This is the usual variety that folks grow in their gardens, the kind you find at the grocery store. So I just cut off the end there so the peeler has something to grab onto. The peels can be kind of tough on eggplant and they can give the ratatouille sort of a distracting texture. So we're gonna just take the peel off. So I'll just trim off the end here and I'll cut the eggplant into one inch chunks, just like we did the onions. Now you notice what Becky's doing here as she's cutting that eggplant, she's 
creating flat surfaces. So she took that round bulbous eggplant, cut it in half, creates two flat surfaces. That makes it much more safe to cut the eggplant and any other vegetable, really, that you are working on. So it's been about 10 minutes. You can see the onions are starting to get a little bit translucent and soft. So we'll add a couple of flavorings. I have one bay leaf and a quarter teaspoon of red pepper flakes. Oh, a little spice. Just a teeny bit. <laughs> and then I have Herbe de Provence. This is a classic French dried herb blend. It has lavender, rosemary, savory, marjoram, mm -hmm. thyme, you name it. it it's the really lavender. Good. Yeah. I think that really sets it apart. I love that smell. Yeah. Makes you think you're in Provence, right? Yes. <laughs> so one and a half teaspoons of that. And we'll just let that cook for a minute or so, just until everything gets really fragrant. With the spices and the herbs that Becky just put in, a lot of those flavor compounds in there are oil soluble. So it's a great idea to add them right to the hot oil so their flavors can bloom. That's right, and you can smell them when they bloom, right? Instantly. It comes, comes right up. Okay, so that's been about a minute, and now we'll add our eggplant. Okay. And you know, undercooked eggplant is the worst. <laughs> it is the worst. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> it's like styrofoam. Yes, it is. <laughs> so we're going to make sure the eggplant cooks way down, because it actually becomes really nice and creamy and silky when it cooks down. It's going to melt down, become this gorgeous sauce, really nice. And I have two pounds of plum tomatoes. They've been peeled and seeded. And these are fresh? These are fresh, yeah. You want to use nice, fresh tomatoes okay. if you can find them. Yep. But can you use canned tomatoes? If you can't find good fresh ones, yeah. Use a whole 28-ounce can of tomatoes, drain off the juices, and chop them up. OK, great. So the tomatoes go in the pot. I'm going to add a little more salt and pepper, half a teaspoon of salt, quarter teaspoon of pepper. So I told you I had a trick for driving right. off all that extra water. If we left the ratatouille on the stovetop, it would be hard to crank the heat up high enough to evaporate all that water because we would risk burning the bottom of the pot. So we're going to put the ratatouille in the oven where the dry ambient heat can drive off all that moisture with no risk of burning. Okay. So the oven's at 400 degrees. We'll let that cook in the oven for 40 to 45 minutes until the veggies get nice and browned and broken down. I love this. This is a hands-off ratatouille. Then 45 minutes. Let's take a look. Ooh, I'm too short to see. <laughs> Ooh, it looks good. Oh, it looks great. <gasps> okay, now I can get a better look. Look yeah. at that. That color in the pot, that's the kind of color I usually associate with roasting in a big, wide open pan, but for it to happen right here in the Dutch oven, that's great. That's right, because we had the lid off, there was lots of evaporation, and we got so much good browning that we're not going to have to worry about browning the remaining vegetables. So I told you we were going to turn that eggplant into a sauce. So I'm going to start mashing away here. So this is the genius part of this ratatouille. For years, we've been asking eggplant to stay intact after hours of slow, low cooking and stewing. But here we go. We're actually asking the eggplant to break down, something it wants to do naturally, and we're turning it into a sauce. Even better, now that the eggplant is a part of the sauce, we're going to get that flavor in every single bite. And Becky's got out her aggressions. <laughs> That's right. I feel so much better. I'm all relaxed. <laughs> Plus, I know I'm going to have something good to eat at the end. That's true. <laughs> See how it's turning into this really creamy, yes. silky sauce? OK, I think that's looking pretty good. So now we'll add the rest of the vegetables. I have two zucchini, also cut into one inch pieces, no tiny little dice. One yellow bell pepper, one red bell pepper, and a quarter teaspoon each of salt and pepper. I'll just stir that in. And you're adding these at the end because we want to keep the shape of these vegetables and some of that freshness? That's right. So we have the eggplant, the tomato, and the onion. They're really broken down, really caramelized and sweet. And then we'll have the contrast of the zucchini and the peppers with a nice freshness and a little bit of texture, a little bit of bite. I'm going to put this back in the oven for another 20 to 25 minutes. OK, sounds good. So the pot was in the oven for 25 minutes. Then I took it out, put the lid on, and now it's been sitting for 10 minutes. And I've been waiting for eight hours. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Here we go. Ta-da! Oh, gorgeous. Yeah, nice bright colors, right? Uh, you know what I love is that the zucchini, I can still see them. And the peppers, they yep. haven't just broken down into the sauce. I'm just going to take a paring knife and check and see. See how it slides right in? Oh, yeah. So they're tender, but they're not broken down. They're going to have a little bit of bite, a little bit of texture. That's great. I see that bay leaf. I'm just going to take that out. Now, when the lid was on the pot, it was steaming a little bit. And you'll see this fond that's been mm -hmm. created on the side of the pot. That's full of flavor. Anytime you see brown fond, brown little bits in your pot, you want to incorporate it back into the dish because it'll make it taste even better. So I'm just scraping off that fond, getting it down into the pot. All right, let's add a couple of last-minute flavorings. 
I have a tablespoon of sherry vinegar. Hmm. Now, this is not at all traditional, but our veggies have gotten so caramelized, so sweet, that we felt that it needed a little bit of acid just to kind of brighten things up. And then some herbs. I have a tablespoon of parsley, just for some freshness, and a tablespoon of basil. Ooh, I can really smell that vinegar. And vinegar is one of those seasonings that you should keep right by the stove top. A little bit of vinegar, salt, pepper, maybe even a pinch of sugar can take a dish from ordinary to extraordinary. It's true. All right, let's dive in. Now, we're serving it hot, but ratatouille, it's good cold, it's good at room temperature. Drizzle of olive oil for you, please. A little bit of basil? Yes, please. And we have some bread there if you want. Sometimes I put uh, an, an egg on this and make it into dinner. I love you even more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go as is because I think it looks like perfection. Yes, I agree. What I love, it tastes like a stew. Mm -hmm. It doesn't taste like a mush of a bunch of different ingredients. You can really taste every single thing that you put in that pot, starting from those sauteed onions, getting a little bit of lavender can really get. Yeah. And the texture is perfect. I like that my spoon has eggplant in it, and it's not mushy because it's a sauce. So many different flavors. Mm. It's not watery at all. Becky, this is the most excellent ratatouille I've ever had. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Thanks so much. Finally, a ratatouille that is even better than the sum of its parts, and it's easy to make too. Bloom the flavors of fragrant herb de Provence and sauteed onions, add chopped eggplant and tomatoes, and then stew them, not on the stovetop, but in the oven until tender. Then mash the eggplant into a sauce for flavor in every single bite. Stir zucchini and red peppers in the sauce and finish with a flourish of fresh basil and parsley, not to mention a smidge of sherry vinegar to add brightness to the pot. So there you have it. From our test kitchen to your kitchen, the most incredible walkaway ratatouille. And you can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and selected episodes on our website. America's Test Kitchen .com. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.